Okay, so we're about to get started. Uh, welcome everyone to another edition of Carbon Talks. My name is Kian Grending, and I'm standing in for our executive director, Michael Small, who's in Ottawa today. Today's Carbon Talk is entitled Resilient Renewable Cities, and it seeks to answer the question, how do you reduce energy use and shift to renewables while ensuring resiliency in a city? And we've got two very esteemed colleagues here in Larry Beasley and Stephen Shepard. But before we get to introductions, I'd just like to ask a question of the, the crowd. How many of you have attended a Carbon Talk before? Can you put up your hand? Okay, about half. And how many of you have not attended a Carbon Talk before? Okay, including Larry. <laughs> so I'll just explain our format. Uh, carbon Talks are heavy on dialogue. And so we've got about 10 or 15 minutes of presentation uh, from these two. And uh, the remainder of the dialogue is focused on you and your Q&A for each other, but also the panelists. Uh, I'll also give out a reminder. Hi, welcome. Some C's over here. This event is being webcast live, so I'll welcome our web viewers. And if you are online, you can join us on Twitter at our hashtag RECities. Uh, you can also tweet your questions to at Carbon Talks, and we'll ask um, Larry and Stephen later on. So Carbon Talks is part of the SFU Center for Dialogue, and we are proudly funded uh, by the North Growth and Sitka Foundations. And without the support of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, the webcast would not be possible. So to all of those uh, groups, I give my thanks. And lastly, this event is actually taking part, uh, it's actually part of a larger week, a community summit put on by SFU's Public Square called We the City. So if you haven't been to SFU Public Square's website, there's a huge roster of city building events. I recommend that you go and take a look. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce our two uh, panelists and we'll get right into it. So Larry Beasley, seated on the right, is a distinguished practice professor of planning at the UBC School of Community and Regional Planning. He's also the founding principal of Beasley and Associates. Associates and along with Anne McAfee, was the longest serving co-director of planning in Vancouver during its transform transformative years for the core city. He is also a member of the Order of Canada, and he's just released a new book entitled Eco Design. Seated uh, to Larry's left is Stephen Shepard, who is the director of the Collaborative for Advanced Landscape Planning at UBC. Stephen directs an applied research group which develops and tests powerful visualization tools and engagement processes to help communities move towards low carbon, resilient, and attractive futures. Uh, he also advises the city on the Renewable City Action Committee. Some of you might have heard the news that the city of Vancouver just released its 100% renewable energy strategy last week, and that's going back before council tomorrow morning, or yeah, I believe it's in the morning. So without further ado, I'll uh, leave it to Larry, who will start us off. Thank you. Great. Uh, Thank you, Ken, and ladies and gentlemen, I see a lot of friends in the audience, so I hope you'll really perk up and make this uh, a good event. Resilience and the urban quality of being renewable, or what I prefer to generalize as being sustainable, are uh, about both the structure and the infrastructure of cities. And so each of us with our different backgrounds are going to be covering both sides of that equation. I'm not a scientist. I don't know a lot of the science of uh, of sustainability, I'm a planner. And so I'm gonna be really talking more about urban structure and the, uh, the, the various strat some of the strategies for urban structure that will help us uh, achieve some of the uh, things that we have to achieve. I'm not also gonna to go too much into resilience. I think Stephen has got a lot more to say about that. In fact, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing Stephen about his work in that area. I want to move directly to uh, renewable or sustainable cities. And we all know that this is about climate change. It's about reversing, um, mitigating, I would say, or trying to reverse the climate change that we're already seeing and bringing the cities more in harmony with nature. Uh, and I think this requires us to very aggressively restructure the cities from what we've seen in the 20th century in order for them to be to use less carbon, to um, use less resources overall, and to cancel the pollutions that are uh, so detrimental so that they can become more uh, um, compatible. I would even argue, and many people are nowadays, that they can become contributing 
to the uh, ecological setting in which they sit. In uh, my book, which I wrote with uh, Jonathan Barnett, Eco Design, we talk about a lot of solutions that have to do with more intelligent uh, ecological deployment of urban landscape. We also talk about uh, treatments and networks of open space to try to get open space into a network that can function in terms of uh, the needs of others, uh, other um, interests rather than just uh, human beings. Um, and we talk about the, the um, management of the interface between the rural and natural uh, uh, setting of cities and urban development. It seems that it's true everywhere in the world that as we simply touch the landscape, we despoil it, and we start to uh, 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 really bring a lot of negative impacts on the ecologies around it. Um, it's interesting that we're beginning to see around North America in particular, in some areas in Europe, with the GIS capacities that we have, we're beginning to see um, uh, uh, environmental considerations now brought right into zoning. So whereas zoning traditionally has been about managing the relationship of uses and things like that, uh, we, can now we can now use our zoning to, uh, to shift development away from sensitive areas. We can use it to, uh, in very subtle ways, to uh, um, shape how development hits the landscape so that it minimizes uh, negative effects even, even as um, development occurs. And that'll be a fresh thing. It's not widely used yet, but every year you see more of it. But from the point of view of urban structure, the, to me, the most promising solutions come down to a very simple principle. It's just so simple, and that's proximity. Getting the things that uh, people want to do closer together uh, for an array of benef benefits, less energy used, reuse of the energy that we do consume, and, of course, taking pressure off those sensitive areas. Uh, and we know that proximity also plays well to the other um, themes of sustainability. We know that it plays well. There's a lot of research that shows it pays, plays well to economic opportunity, social intercourse, public health, uh, improved public health, and uh, even cultural vitality. So it's a very simple principle, but a very powerful principle around which uh, we've been able to, in, in my practice, we've been able to um, uh, shape a lot of what we're trying to do for more uh, sensitive cities. Uh, and proximity is really about the uh, old, we all know this, it's about density, it's about intensity, it's about diversity and mixed use, and then it's about active transportation alternatives um, once we get those origins and destinations closer together. And right now, I suspect you're all bored. <laughs> you know why? Because you know that. You know everything that I've said. It's not new. But what I find pretty fascinating about that, that short description that I've, I've given you is that uh, we all know about it. Everyone in this room knows about it and believes in it. And yet most consumers out in society are not buying much of it. They're not buying many of the things that we are talking about. And this, I think, is the one of the greatest denials in the whole movement towards a more sustainable city. Um, fully 60% of Canadians, mostly people who live in suburbs in Canada, are not buying into the agenda of sustainability. And they don't really seem to care much about the kind of issues that I was describing earlier. Uh, in all the work in that in this country that planners like myself have done over the last generation to repopulate our downtowns and all that stuff, intensify, we've only shifted the, the demographics by less than 5%. So it was, you know, we're, we, yes, we've been, it's positive, we've been making uh, some consumers think differently, but not most consumers. Uh, and that, to me, uh, is the biggest problem that we face. 60% of the people in this country hate density almost all kinds of density. Most of them are very skitsy uh, about diversity. They don't believe it has the positive impacts that, that I would talk about. And uh, they love their cars. And they'll tell you they love their cars. And uh, in fact, 
their hope is that the car becomes carbon neutral before some Gestapo tells them they can no longer use their car. Because frankly, in a free society, uh, they'll change the Gestapo rather than start using their car. And it's very interesting in my work around the world, what we're finding is that as people get more wealth, one of the first things they, do, they go for is private personal mobility. In fact, they do it before they even get, de get decent housing. And so what that is, what, and we all know the impacts of that, and what that's causing around the world is dramatic. And it's even worse than some of the other countries of the world. And you'd say to yourself, well, let's, let's think of some really forward-thinking countries like the Netherlands. Well, I can tell you that car ownership in the Netherlands is also going up. It's going up in every single society in the entire world. And, uh, you know, frankly, most consumers would tell you it's not their problem. And most of them are right in one respect because most of those consumers are going to be gone when the collapse really starts to manifest itself in dramatic ways. And they don't have to think so much about that. The problem is really not their, their problem. The problem is really our problem. Uh, we have to find sustainable solutions, resilience solutions, that uh, people can embrace now, that in the private marketplace they will prefer, they'll spend their money on. Um, we have to find popular, sustainable solutions. And this worries me because it's one of those things that our whole movement hasn't thought very much about. Uh, we haven't thought much about how, how, uh, how anyone might want to take uh, uh, the ideas that we're putting forward. We sort of just think it's going to be so horrible that they'll just do it automatically or that there'll be laws that'll force people to do it. Um, and I'm afraid that's not going to be the case. You know, so how do you tame density? How do you bring benefits to a wide, wide uh, group of people in society of diversity? Uh, how do you make them go for those active transportation choices for many of the trips that they will take every day? And I think I'm just to ginger the discussion for the rest of the hour. I'm going to suggest that it's all about urban design, or designing in the features with every single one of the moves that we have to take for a more sustainable city that would make those appealing, attractive, delightful, um, and all of that, bringing design carefully into every single thing we start to think about. And that's why I was happy uh, to learn more about what Stephen is doing on uh, having charrettes, design charrettes, to talk about uh, energy issues because uh, every single thing has to be transferred into a form that consumers uh, can find attractive because we are in a free society. I, I, like to, I always like to use the example, and many of you know about it, uh, and that was the restructuring of downtown Vancouver, I, something I had something to do with, where... You know, we wanted to entice people to come back downtown, but at the time we were trying to do that, the entire world was fleeing downtowns. They all thought downtowns, and this downtown in particular, was a pretty horrible place. And so we had to literally think, rethink from a design perspective every single dimension of living and working in a core city at high density. We had to humanize density uh, in measures that are now being uh, uh, copied around the world, but at the time were very special. Uh, we had to find a way to mix households in a, in, in, a, in a format that would be kind of harmless to the average person while still providing some housing to the poorest of our citizens. Not nearly enough, I have to say. It's the biggest issue we all uh, continue to have here. We had to find a way to add lush amenities uh, into the equation so that, it, so that the place would be as popular as those suburban alternatives. Uh, we had to find a way to target new consumer groups, particularly families with children. We had to take the downtown and turn it from a place that you were you were interested in if you were young or elderly, but uh, and, and and to a place that average citizens, families, households would be interested in. And we had to completely change the planning and regulatory framework uh, in order to make that work in a free market economy, and in order to find some new ways to pay for it, because there was no way that the existing f uh, tax regime in this city or any other city was prepared to pay for the kind of things we need. And in the middle of all that, we had to bring all the citizens 
right back into the heart of the process. As, as citizens, yes, as voters, yes, but even more importantly, as consumers. We had to ask them what it is that they wanted, and then we had to work with them of how they could be, th those things they wanted could be delivered in the kind of framework and formats that we had to do in a high density, high rise, and, uh, and diverse city. And now we have to bring that same kind of proposition out to the suburbs. It's, it's deplorable how badly our suburbs have been structured, and yet it's almost impossible to change that. I talked to a whole group of suburban developers recently, and they said, you don't live with a straitjacket of rules and regulations that we have to live with. We don't design suburbs, they said. We just lay them out according to rules that were actually invented back in the 1950s in the interest of automobile accessibility. That was what it was all about. I, I talk about this a little bit more in an op-ed piece you might have seen on the weekend in the sun, so I'm not going to go much into it today, but it is the biggest single challenge of the next generation of planners. The people in this room, 25 or younger, it is the biggest challenge because if, you don't, if we don't transform those suburbs, we don't have a fighting chance to transform the rest of our cities, the rest of our, our settlement to be uh, sustainable and resilient. So uh, the, the co topic today is about technical innovation and I think we'll talk a lot about that, but it's also about finding a way to make the moves we need to take. Uh, important to consumers, noticing that those, that interest will build itself into a consumer trend that will become a consumer movement. And what I've noticed around the world is that consumer trends are way more powerful than any law and any regulation to shape the cities. And in fact, if consumers wish, they will change the people who govern them and they will change the laws and they will change the regulations in order to be able to consume what they wish unless we are prepared to remove ourselves from a free market private society. So that's just to uh, get us started. I hope we'll have a good conversation. I'll turn it over to Stephen. Thank you, Larry. Uh, I think you'll find a few points that resonate uh, with what Larry just said very eloquently. Um, I think I'm going to try and take a, a, a slightly broader tack looking at uh, different aspects of the biophysical and the social infrastructure that uh, relate to certainly renewable energy, but also relate to uh, the need for climate change adaptation. Am I too far away? Okay. Uh, so there's probably four main things I'm going to uh, try and touch on, and I hope we can come back and, and chat about some of these uh, through the discussions with, with the audience here. Um, Obviously, energy supplies, uh, renewable energy supplies, the, the sort of bold move that uh, Vancouver City Council has made with the 100% renewable strategy uh, is, I think, uh, an important step forward for, for Canada. Um, there's lots of places in Europe that have, have been out there in front already, but uh, this kind of sets, changes, sets the bar a little higher for many of the municipalities and regions in, in Canada. We've been a little bit behind on renewable energy, really. Uh, we live in BC. It's Saudi Arabia of renewable energy. I mean, any kind of energy you want, most of it we've got somewhere, but the pattern is different, and every municipality, every region has a different mix. Uh, Ellen Pond used to work at Calp with us as a Calp affiliate, he called it a cocktail of energy solutions, and every city has a different cocktail. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, we've done some mapping, for example, in Metro Vancouver that suggests that up to one third, possibly even a half of the total building energy that's needed and the current demand levels in Metro Vancouver could be provided inside the boundaries of Metro Vancouver. Now, if you think about it right now, probably, I'm guessing, I don't know the actual number, 99 point something percent of our energy enters the region from somewhere else. And there's no real reason why uh, we could not devise a system, including policies, including social engagement, uh, to be an energy generator, uh, whether it's the home level or it's the industrial hubs or uh, large scale within the region. So we could certainly uh, explore that a little bit more, I hope. Um, second major point is that if we're going to engage in these large scale mitigation measures, and they do need to be large scale, and they do involve restructuring our, our cities and our fabric, I completely agree about that. Um, we have to do that with the knowledge that we're not in a steady state environment. Everything's changing because of climate change uh, and, and other trends that are going on simultaneously. Um, 
And so we need to do some pretty uh, systematic planning for the kinds of climate change impacts that we're going to receive. Uh, many cities locally are starting to do adaptation strategies and, and vulnerability assessments, but much more of that work needs to be done. So that when we're citing things like new energy or uh, energy systems or just uh, climate proofing our buildings uh, of various kinds, um, then you have to think about you know, much more severe storms in the future, much more severe uh, water management problems, heat waves, you know, you know all the lists of sort of the extreme events that we're getting a bit more familiar with now. Um, and that means changing things like building codes and planning to take, a, take account of these things. Um, so I think that's, that's pretty important and probably we can play out some of the ways that that might affect things uh, in the city. Related to that, I guess the third point would be about uh, not just sort of the hard infrastructure, but the soft infrastructure, the green infrastructure, and the fact that this is going to probably have be of increasing importance in the, in the coming years. Um, I'm not just saying that because we have a new urban forestry program at UBC, that's my disclosure, um, but, uh, but I think that in itself is a response to an incredible demand that is rising. Again, cities are starting to produce urban forestry strategies or re remake the ones that they have. Uh, we're looking at, you know, four degrees of warming over the century unless we really do something very radical globally. Um, and uh, improve forest canopy is one of the ways, one of the key ways that we can manage uh, both uh, the heat, uh, offset some of those rises in heat, reduce energy, uh, the cooling demand. Uh, we're going to see an increased demand for air conditioning in this, in this region and across BC, and that's going to impact energy demand um, and many other things. So anything we can do to offset it, offset it and manage water on a much larger scale, it's going to require a, a, a kind of a restructuring of the green infrastructure. It's not just expand some pipes here and plant a few more trees in the strips there. Um, it's probably going to take more space, uh, and that's going to bring it into conflict with other demands, other sustainability demands. And you've seen that in places like Surrey, any of the urban cores. Um, so how do we bring a viable piece of nature that really is providing ecosystem services for us, never mind that it's attractive and beautiful and keeps people healthier? Uh, and I think this ties very much to things like uh, active transportation. We can need that green network to allow people to move, to attract people out of their cars and onto the bikes and skateboards and what have you. Um, and then the last thing, I think, is just to reiterate a point that you made, Larry, which is the, um, the importance of the, the public, the consumer, the, uh, the neighborhoods, um, all those folk who, uh, again, not in this room, but um, many of them do have quite a lot of concern, but it's not focused, it's not shaped. They're not the people that would ever show up at a planning meeting. They don't, they have, they're way too busy, you know. Um, so how do we reach them? How do we uh, engage them? And, and I would argue that we need um, more systematic, more effective approaches to engage people in all of these kinds of issues, whether energy, climate change, adaptation, um, in all of the neighborhoods. And so something that will spread across, and it's not just communication, it's not just presenting information. We know that doesn't work by itself. Um, so we think that there are some very innovative new approaches that have been tested in small areas around the world, some of them here in BC, uh, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, which is a big supporter of Carbon Talks, has uh, funded several social mobilization research projects, all of which have reported out. And some of those are producing significant reductions in GHGs in a matter of months, if not years, way faster than policy tools. Those are essential as well, of course. So we think that some of these more innovative approaches around competition and engagement and um, use of visual media and social media to bring people together and let them have fun while they're fixing their neighborhoods and work together uh, really needs to be explored a lot further. So I hope we can explore that a little bit more. I'll just finish by saying that I think we do need more of these holistic sort of adaptation and mitigation together, whether it's energy or new building design or uh, urban design, uh, to, to systematically incorporate those things. And that means we're going to have to cross over the boundaries of the disciplines and get urban foresters working with the city engineers and the stormwater guys and the architects all to sort of reframe these, these, the new cities of the future. Um, so with that, I'm going to 
I hope we can uh, throw that open for discussion. Great. Well, thank you very much. Some very provocative thoughts on local energy generation, engagement, resiliency, and urban planning. So um, hopefully that stimulates a great discussion. So uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to handle this side of the room, and my colleague Angela will handle the other side of the room. What I'll ask you to do is just hold up your hand if you have a question. I'll hand you the mic, and I'll ask you to keep your uh, questions very short so we can get to uh, the answer portion. Um, I'll ask my colleague Catherine Sheps at the back of the room to let me know if there's any questions from Twitter. Uh, so without any further ado, let's start the uh, Q&A. And we have a question right here. Hello, uh, my name is Hendrik Bjorn. I'm, uh, I've been trained in ecology at the University of British Columbia. And uh, for the last few years, I've been concentrating on permaculture design, um, which uh, focuses more on local solutions, which you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned problems with energy conservation, the city heating up. Um, one thing, and you mentioned, um, I forget, but something else important. I really admire your programs in cities around the world, which I've seen. Um, one thing uh, that they often say about uh, finding solutions is uh, necessity is the matter of invention. Go to the downtown east side. You see a lot of very resilient people there that have come up with very innovative solutions by themselves. You say you're looking for people to get more engaged. Well, I designed a project uh, to recycle food scraps from our building, the Woodwards, with the local urban farm right across the street. It's a closed-loop food system. Uh, we generate compost uh, that can be regrown into food on the farm, also on our rooftop. I think all new buildings should have facilities like that built into them. Green roofs are important. We're taking a piece away from nature. We need pollinator cor cor corridors for pollinators to get through the city. We should uh, rewild the cities and uh, put it into our design to keep nature active in there. That's just a comment, but perhaps you have other comments about it. They come from a very progressive country, the Netherlands, like you said. Well, I could listen to you for another half hour, just for what it's worth. So um, what, what strikes me was something you said at the beginning, though, and, and, and again, this is my bias more as a planner and the politics of planning. And that is that, um, in my opinion, in most cities, genuine creative production engagement between individuals, institutions, and government is not happening very much. There, we've turned public engagement into almost like a rote system. We have two or three or four ways to do it. In many parts of the United States, it is even legislated how you have to do it, and you can't do it differently. Um, and the net effect is that it tends to be a few people telling a lot of people rather than a lot of people telling the few people. And um, I think that's a big problem. I'm doing a project up in the Nordic countries with all of, the, um, all of, all of those countries. And what they're doing is that they are, uh, the government is going searching for smart activities that are going on in any of those countries. And then they're going to go and ask permission to participate with them and give them some money, but also ask permission to participate with them in order to bring what they're trying to do to a higher level. And some of that is, uh, is building new communities. Some of it is, is systems development. It, 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 that, it, there's all kinds of things happening. But the point is it's a very different approach. Instead of government going to people and saying, I need you, so now tell me something, is going to people and say, saying, you know, you're trying to do something, and maybe I can help. And I think that's a very different approach. And, and I think it's the approach we have to bring back. It's, it's just I've become uh, very, very upset, in, even in my, our city here over the last five years, that um, genuine public engagement and then living with the results of that public engagement has pretty much stopped. And it has to be started back again. And actually, you guys, you guys just have to make it start again, in my opinion. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Stephen, anything to add? or uh, Just that, that I, I do think that the, the role of locally produced solutions, uh, locally distributed uh, resources, and things that are generated locally or recycled locally is, is certainly a huge part of the mix. And, there's a lot more we, we need to encourage from that. Great, thanks. I think we have a question back here. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Grigg, and uh, I happen also to be uh, a neighbor of Stephen uh, in the next block. 
So, um, Larry, uh, just building on the last statement you made, um, it has to be more than a few people telling a lot of um, people how to live and change. And you mentioned the statistic of 60% of the people really don't give a damn. So, um, building on that, um, uh, I'm thinking that perhaps um, preaching to the masses is not being that effective and that we need a new way of looking at things. And so here's my suggestion for your comment, and I have another one for Stephen following. Uh, the suggestion for comment, uh, your comment is we need to change the culture, not at this room level, but within the schools. Um, so if we think about children going through the schools and how it has been said they've been very effective in changing their parents' habits in terms of recycling and reuse, we could perhaps do the same about energy use and transportation. So how do we bring about this cultural change? Um, I'm actually part of a small group of people um, thinking about that leadership of teaching the teachers. So if we can teach the teachers going through the universities, then take the message to the school children within six years, their teenagers, and become passionate advocates for change in society, energy use and transportation. So I'd like your comment on that. And Stephen, um, you probably don't know this because you're a bit so busy, but this morning they took down another large maple tree on our road. <laughs> so um, I had a look at all the uh, severed limbs. I uh, didn't find any sign of disease. I'm absolutely sure it was taken down for a good reason. I did ask, what was the plan for replacing the shade trees? Is there a plan? And they said no. And I'm not aware, and perhaps there is someone in this uh, room can tell me otherwise, that there is a plan for shade versus ornamental trees in Vancouver. So we know that um, the city of Vancouver have been, well, basically putting the message out. Look, uh, we're losing the tree canopy. We're losing the shade trees. That affects our summer comfort, winter light. Uh, so uh, there doesn't seem to be a plan. We could have a plan, shade trees east-west and ornamentals north-south. It could be as simple as that, but there doesn't seem to be a plan. So maybe you've got some other information. You can give us some comfort. Thank you. Well, um, first on, on your point about um, involving schools and children and all that, I commend you to uh, look at um, Chihuahua in Mexico. They have a, they have a water problem a very intense lack of water, and they have to conserve water. And they, no, nothing was working. As, they, as people became a little bit wealthier, they were just using more water, more water, more water. And so they, what they did is that they went into the schools and they taught it to the children. And then they basically uh, motivated the children to become the water policemen for their families. And they had a very dramatic impact very, very dramatic impact. And it was because not only, you know, would the parent learn something new, but you get kind of embarrassed that you didn't know it in the first place and your kid's wondering why you didn't know it in the first place. And it was very effective. Uh, and uh, also, uh, Jaime Lerner in Curitiba has used young people and young education uh, as a way to uh, get into uh, communities of people that otherwise he could never talk to or never touch really in their very modest, uh, poor society. Those are examples, but I think that what's going to be needed in the uh, challenge that we've all talked about is not one of those boutique, one-off kind of operations. What's going to be needed is a layering upon layering of different kinds of engagement for all kinds of different people that's designed around their needs and, and abilities, not our needs and abilities as planners. We like to say that uh, public engagement to really work well is like a triangle. Up at the top, there's a few very active citizens. Some people negatively call them the, uh, the professional citizens. I like them, but they can also lead us in the wrong direction because they just want to take it their way. And then below them, there's a whole bunch of people who lead community organizations, child care and the PTA and all that. 
And they're, they're involved in their community, but they're pretty much looking at what their particular interests there. And then below them is a whole group of just a huge group of people that are going about their business. And a good public engagement program is going to engage the, all that energy at the top to help open up the doors to those people in the middle and then take all that energy to help open up the doors to and, and thinking and consciousness of all the rest of those people. And what it ends up being is a, a rich layering of techniques. What we do now is, is this. We say, okay, we're going to have a public meeting tonight. First, tonight may not be right, because a lot of families, tonight is where they do all their family stuff. They can't come to our meetings. And then they come to the meetings, and there's no place there's no child care to look after their kids. So the first time they come to a meeting, they realize they can't go to a meeting anymore because the kid's all running around. And it's a and then they get hungry because it takes the time for dinner. And then it's not in a convenient place. And in other words, it's designed for us, our convenience, not designed for people. And what we tried to do years ago when we were replanning Vancouver's core city is we tried to reach out to people on their turf, in their way, in their language, when they wanted it, and giving them as many supports as we can. In some places, our public engagement, we even pay people to come. We pay very modest income people who otherwise can't come because they got to go make a living, right? So, and I'm not saying you have to do that, but you have to have many techniques that really reach people. And when you do that, you'll start learning stuff. And you don't learn it from the cognoscenti. You guys are all the cognoscenti, I call you. You're like the smart people. It, you start learning it from other people, what they need to do to make these formulas work for them or what, what we have to do to make these formulas work for them. And then it starts to change. And that hasn't been happening in our suburbs, I can tell you, for at least two generations. It's not happening. And it has to happen because it's going to take that kind of intense. You know, it took us an entire generation to just bring people back to live in the core cities of, of our country. An entire generation, that's 30 years, that's my whole life. Almost. Well, half of it. <laughs> you know? But, but, and it's going to take that kind of real dedication to a different vision for those p parts of our cities and then working with people day in and day out and day in and day out. I, I like to say that a good public engagement program is out there talking to people every day of the year except Christmas and box, Boxing Day. So maybe I could just add a couple of things, David, to your, your dual question here. Just on the, uh, uh, the role of getting to the, the youth and to the kids and the schools, I do agree with you. I think that's, that's hugely important uh, as an underutilized way of getting that breadth, that in, in embedding things into the community. It's being done in certain areas, but it's not being done uh, on some of the other crucial things. It's being done quite well for waste and recycling, but unfortunately those are a very tiny percentage of where our GHGs come from. Uh, so just to give you one uh, story, one example of something that we think is working or could work well if it was uh, uh, implemented, uh, we've been working on a, a video game that kids just naturally gravitate to. It's an educational video game on climate change. It was, I think I mentioned it to you before, it's in Delta. It's called Future Delta 2. It's available online. You can download it as a game off the web, futuredelta2.ca. Um, and we found that it's, it's the single most popular thing we've ever done to try and engage people on climate change. And it talks about energy and transportation and urban form and retrofitting homes and all these things that, you know, what's that mean to a kid? Not much, right? other than 17-year-olds pitched it, sort of 16, 17, 18-year-olds. Uh, they all want to get in the car and drive. So we've, they're switching hummers for Teslas in the, uh, in the game and tagging things that have to do with climate change. And it's trying to get them to see their own neighborhoods differently. It's a place-based game. We're trying to figure out a way that every school in British Columbia could have its own game, local game, place-based game, where the kids walk around their own neighborhoods and they see things differently. They have carbon goggles and things like that. It's simply a way in. It's not necessarily the, the whole answer. But if we can get, if we can find ways in like that have a buzz that people just naturally gravitate to, you know, not the conventional top-down kind of information flow. Um, we've got the technologies for that now, and I think teachers are very interested in that, and the new curriculum is shifting in that direction, and we're hoping to influence that and to try and, and build some of these measures in. Uh, 
Uh, and coming back to our tree, I do know the tree you mean. <laughs> I walked by it last night. It looked fine to me, too, so I'm not quite sure what happened. But uh, I know the city is obviously working on a strategy, uh, uh, and there may be people here, I don't know if Tamsin, you want to talk to that, uh, about what the city's strategy is. Um, uh, and so that would be really interesting to hear, because that's, that's very much in development, uh, and many cities are putting together these new plans that should have these kinds of guidelines. Uh, the one thing I'd say just to connect the two, those two questions is that um, I think, again, there are some very promising approaches to engaging people at the block level in their own neighborhoods. You know, we've talked about this before. You know, next time we do a block party, we're going to have some kind of little session where we can talk about mapping our own trees, mapping our own, own area, a little bit of citizen science, but make it fun. You know, there's lots of examples where you make it fun for people and all of a sudden, it's interesting and meaningful to them. They don't, may not care two hoots about renewable energy or climate change, but they do care about their blocks. So I think there's some toolkits that are emerging that could be very helpful for, for the blocks. But I'd suggest maybe we, we... Yeah, I'll hand the mic over to Tamsin. Um, if, when you ask a question, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself as well, and I'll ask that of all other uh, speakers. So I'll hand the mic to you. Hey, Tamsin Mills from the city of Vancouver. Uh, yeah, just quickly, the urban forest strategy is looking at planting strategies which will address not only uh, what can we do in terms of urban heat island mitigation, but also what species make sense where and sort of moving, shifting towards shade, providing trees, etc. As well, Metro Vancouver is working on guidelines for adaptation for urban forests specifically. So they're coming out with guidelines uh, that work there was a workshop last week, and I, I think they're aiming for beginning of next year. By the way, uh, if you're uh, just not to go into it, but a very interesting format of what we were just describing is the what's called the Guggenheim Labs. And if you look at uh, go on the website and you can look those up, and what they do is they go into an area. They've done this in Berlin, New York, elsewhere. You go into a local area, you audit the area, you do different kind of games and information collection in the area, and then you can apply what you're learning to other areas. So we're, for example, thinking of applying the Guggenheim Lab approach to say, um, we think there's a lot of um, answers for suburbs in the old streetcar suburbs from the 30s. So what we're going to, what we are trying to organize is to bring suburbanites who are in post-war suburbs and have them come and audit pre-war suburbs and notice what's different, the size of the streets, the diversity of the housing, the diversity of the uh, uh, income of households, the walkability, the transit orientation, the different mix of uses, and then have them go and look at their own neighborhoods and say, you know, what's missing? And, and it's so, it becomes so vivid. But uh, just look up Guggenheim Labs. Great. So we'll take a question here, um, and then we'll go to Twitter, okay, next. and then we'll go to the other side of the room. So question here. Hi, I'm Baldwin Hum. Um, I guess just to build on your comment about diversity, I'm wondering uh, how we can handle or how we would handle diversity for the suburban context, given that the Vancouver solution seems to have imposed a sort of homogeneity of, of solution, which is the podium tower, onto, onto our city. So in the push for density, it seems like we've lost a lot of that, you know, fine-grained, diverse usage at the street level and, and above. Um, and I'm wondering if you have other solutions for the suburbs, which are typically, at least um, stereotypically, known as fairly homogenous areas. Thanks. Well, um, Stephen may have something to say about this. From my point of view, um, I'm a great believer that the tower podium is a unique form suitable in certain locations. And I will defend its application in downtown Vancouver. Citizens told us in no uncertain terms they wanted to get up to be able to see the views and et cetera, et cetera. By the same token, we didn't want to create these really negative areas at the streets. And we also wanted to create alternative housing forms so that there could be row houses and things like that at the street level. That doesn't work in the suburbs. In fact, uh, it, it, is more, it is more typical in densification around the world to go mid-rise and low mid-rise. And uh, that brings up another issue which I just want to put on the table, which is that one of the discoveries we've made in our generation is that the incredibly tightly 
designed buildings that are represented at very, very high-rise construction where the, um, the, the securities become very tight are not very good buildings to convert and reuse over time. And what we have to do is come to, as we develop a more sustainable city, we have to come to more modular building formats, which are usually mid-rise formats, where it can be, you know, housing today, offices tomorrow, a hotel some other time, and it can have many, many uses. And many of us are going back to two 19th century forms that have proven to be very, very robust, and, and one of those is the English-style row house, which can be offices, housing, hotel, almost anything you want it. And, um, and those late 19th century um, uh, warehouses, the mid-century, usually six-story tall warehouse you see in something like, you see a lot here, but you also see a lot, say, in a place like uh, Portland, Oregon, which, again, can be literally any use, and it work, they work well with, at any use. If you tried to take a tower podium building and convert it into offices, it's tough. Or if you try to convert it into every one of those units having a, a subdividable smaller unit inside of it, it's almost impossible. And yet that may be what we need in, in the future. So just getting much more agile building forms is important and they're probably gonna be mid-rise. But I'll close my comment with one simple thing. Whenever I've gone out and talked to suburbanites, which I've done a lot in recent years, I didn't do it in my earlier life, but I've done it a lot in recent years, I find they don't, they're not really with us on the high, high, high-rise, high-density. They're just not there. They have a lot of tolerance for other forms, but we never offer those other forms. Generally, in something called plan, uh, um, uh, transit-oriented development, or TODs, and that's one thing that we planners use, you know, it's like a Bible to us. We're generally talking about high rises and the five minute walk around stations and a lot of suburbanites just don't even want to talk to us because that's what we're talking about. But mid rise and low mid rise intense multi use has a lot of a future out in the suburbs. Stephen, uh, would you like to add on? Maybe you can talk a bit sure, about I'll, preferences. Uh, yeah, just to try and make this brief so we get some more answers, more questions. But yes, uh, I think what Larry's described with the, with the concern and sort of the the, the kind of focus very often in the public's mind on sort of tall glass steel towers, um, they, they, they leave a lot to be desired as a general urban form because they're not particularly energy efficient relative to mid-rise and low-rise. Uh, the building code standards are lower and they usually have way too much glass because we all want to see the city, the mountains, right? And that's very inefficient. Nicole Miller's PhD shows that. Um, as well as a lot of social issues around, uh, you know, people being sort of fragmented and not necessarily knowing their own their own immediate neighbours, which you get that with more ground-oriented uh, buildings. So I'm, I'm, I, I think there is a, a, a wide variety of forms, it's still at reasonably high density, but not the high, high density that you would associate with an urban core. That could be woven in, but it needs to be woven into the fabric and, and sort of variety of buildings. We're working with some of the outlying cities well, I don't know if you call West Vancouver outlying, but anyway, uh, where they have very large single-family home suburbs, and there's, there's plenty of them in the hills and various parts of Metro Vancouver. Um, and we're suggesting, and, and it's being suggested by some locals, that those homes themselves get retrofitted into two, three, four units, right? Uh, cities are going that way. They're allowing for secondary and tertiary suites, West Vancouver has, as an example. Uh, but for aging in place, for just building some density, building some livability in the neighborhood that you love without whole-scale, you know, destruction and, you know, erecting whole new buildings of a different form. It's quite possible. And so I think different suburbs, different types of suburbs have different uh, possibilities. And I think people are open to, if they're involved in a process, allows them to bring forward some of their own suggestions that would add to the amenities. So I think those are important considerations, and they do allow for more diversity of of you know unit size and uh, mixture of, of demographic that I think we're we're looking for for a healthy community. Great. So I'm told our Twitter feed is lighting up, and I'll ask my colleague Catherine to ask a question from Twitter. Okay. This question comes from um, at Jazzy T Berry, who asks, "What role does carbon pricing play in moving the res renewable resilient cities shift forward faster?" 
that's yours. Okay, well, I'm not an economist, and if, if Mark Jacquard was here, he would give a far more eloquent answer. I do think it, it's important. I think it has a huge role. It sets a strong uh, message. BC was, was touted just there. I was listening to BBC Radio 4 on the weekend, and they were talking about BC's highly successful carbon tax because it's not viciously opposed by everybody. It's just sort of grudgingly accepted. Um, <laughs> And which is pretty good for a carbon tax. So uh, I do think it's important. It sets a message. But all too often, I think the conversation goes straight there. And I think and that misses something because it's, a, it's ultimately a top-down solution. I think it's important, but I think we should be looking for top-down, bottom-up, sideways from you know, consultants, universities, interest groups uh, to have sort of mixed solutions. Uh, I think it's, it is important to set a price. Uh, you're going to see... Uh, the provinces, uh, you know, in the next few months, debating how to do this. Uh, I think there are many different ways, but it's, I don't think it's a, a, a one-size-fits-all. I think it's a, a, an important tool. We should be moving in that direction for sure, but we've got to bring in more bottom-up solutions as well. Larry, chance to add on, or should we move to the next question? Well, um, I, 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 I agree with what was just said, but the one thing that I, I believe over the long run is that the... Uh, Carrot solutions work better than the stick solutions. So I'll stop at that. Great. So we have a question on Angela's side of the room, I believe. Uh, next speaker. Hi, my name is Yumi Lee. And um, Larry, you mentioned the intractability of the, um, you know, it, it, whether it's policies or um, schedules that have building codes that are stuck in the 1950s. And um, you see that everywhere new developments are being built around cul-de-sacs and just crazy stuff. Um, and even Vancouver's policy, you know, uh, building codes haven't kept up with policy and are just maybe creeping up maybe eight years later or some such thing. How do we change that? Because all the planners know everything that you know, is being said in this room and much, much more. Um, why isn't that getting implemented? I'll give you my not too serious answer, my serious answer. My not too serious answer, but there's some seriousness, is that we should take all of those codes, put them in the town square, and have a ritual burning <laughs> and start over. Because they really were invented by very good, well-meaning people, but they were invented like three quarters of a century ago, half century ago. And a lot of them are just simply obsolete and out of date. The problem is, they have incredibly powerful advocates, incredibly powerful advocates in government and in their various kinds of sub-professions that they represent. Um, and they use things like liability and safety as, a, as an, a, an aggressive tool against people who want to do things differently. So that's my smart-ass answer. My more serious answer is that... Um, Regulation and codes are very, very important. They're important because they, they are a manifestation of what the community is trying to say it wishes itself to be and its city to be. But what we learned in Vancouver, and we do among the best in the world, by the way, is that these codes have to be discretionary in nature and they have to be transactional in nature. Discretionary in the sense that there's not many very aggressive, hard regulations. There's a lot of different things that could be allowed. And if you do more things, you get more of development. So there's motivation built into those things. Uh, and transactional in the sense that you have smart people in government who work with the smart people in the community and the smart people in the development community to take almost any proposition and take it through a testing against some good community objectives. And if it, if it meets the test, then we try it. They have the power to try it. I'm um, addressing this in Dallas, Texas, in a very big way because they are very, very afraid. The, all the government officials are very afraid to have any discretion. 
They don't want it discretion. It scares them to death. They, they, we're all going to be sued. We're all going to, you know, it's going to be horrible. And if something goes even marginally wrong, I'm going to feel terrible. So there, it's a whole culture of teaching government about taking discretion and then building that into the very structure of the laws. Um, I think that one of the best ways to start that, and by the way, there's a short way to start that, which is a simple proposition called equivalencies. You've probably heard that, where even in a building code, an official can have the right to let you vary the code uh, if you show that it meets equal or better what they're trying to achieve in the particular item in the code. Uh, and uh, in the absence of a lot more dramatic change, I hang my hat on equivalencies any day, and we're using it for heritage and things like that in a much better way. But in the long run, we have to make the whole regulatory system just much more agile. And when we do that, you'll find, you know, I always use this, I'll just tell you to close, I use this very simple test. I call it the cocktail party test. If I can't go to a party with my friends and say, someone told, proposed something like this to me and I found a way to support it because it was a good idea, then I'm embarrassed. If I have to say I couldn't support it because it's against the law, that's a bad idea. Great chance to add on, Stephen. No, I'm, no? I'm okay, we'll have, uh, we've just got a few minutes left. We have two questions left. I'll ask you to keep your questions short so we can just get hear both of them. So over here and then over there, Angela, we'll stack both of them and then we'll give a chance to respond, maybe starting with Stephen and then Larry. Hi, Sam DeGroot. Curious about what you think uh, the role of carbon neutral cars is and planning for carbon neutral automobiles is as part of the whole solution. Well, I can lead off and I'm sure you'll have to, more, more to add, Larry. Um, I think carbon neutral cars are a huge part of the solution. I don't think we're going to get people out of cars quickly. We might be able to convert the fleet quicker. Um, while we're still trying to reduce, it's a bit like energy. You want to reduce the energy demand and then switch the energy supply. And with vehicles, you want to do the same thing. Reduce the demand, but there's still going to be millions of them out there. So let's switch the fuels that are in there. Uh, so as you know, there's, there's huge efforts going on uh, around the world, uh, and including here in Canada, uh, to convert uh, vehicles to elect electric. There's also a lot of interest in hydrogen. But um, the electricity seems uh, more viable in, in the medium term. Uh, and I think it raises really critical issues about where does the energy supply come from. We have, we're blessed with, you know, 95% green electricity here, um, but there's a limit to how much we use. And I think this is another reason why cities are going to renewable energy. It's not just to heat and cool our houses, um, provide all the gadgets that we want. It's to, it's to provide some of that mobility. Um, so, you know, we're, we're exploring things, for example, like... Uh, uh, you know, the, the switch to, to electric vehicles, Teslas, etc. Everyone talks about the Tesla, of course. Uh, but it's one of the fastest growing, uh, more affluent kinds of cars there are. Um, and so are there sort of equivalent things we can do with the buildings that, that link these two together? So that, you know, you, if you have a Tesla, what you, is your house up to the same level as a Tesla? You know, or a, how do you get off the natural gas in your house? And can you provide enough energy on your roof or in your, in your lot to fuel you know, an electric vehicle? So I think we have to think about these as, as systems, um, as well as obviously this huge amount of networks of charging stations and lots of different approaches to that. I think you'll see some of that happening fairly rapidly. The issue is how quickly it will scale up and how does it support the suburbs because that's you know, wh that's where the, the, you get the problem of lack of proximity and lack of density, whether it's charging stations or what have you. The one thing you've got in the suburbs is you've got more space, and that means you've got space, if it was designed appropriately, if the roofs are solar ready, to put solar PVs uh, on the roof. You know, the prices are dropping, I think it was like 10% a year for these things. So they're becoming much more viable. I think it's going to happen. The question is, how widely, how quickly? <laughs> Okay, great. One final question over here, and we'll get quick responses from both our panelists before we uh, move on. Please. Hi, um, I'm Craig Stashuk, an environmental psychologist from the UK. I'm very new to Vancouver, but just slightly related to the last question. Just wondering if there's an expanse to the SkyTrain network, and then if you would use that SkyTrain network to be able to utilize green corridors throughout the suburban areas or even in downtown. 
So with like the viaducts, and you could use parks down below. If there's any sort of projects or any expense to the SkyTrain at all, just to try and get people out of their cars and using the public transport. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. start on this one. The strategy to use rapid transit as a focus for development and then seeing a shift to alternative modes is an obvious strategy. The trouble is that it's too expensive. And so what a lot of places in the world are doing, based on the invention in Kurjiba and uh, Bogota, are going with uh, bus rapid transit. And, foreign, and even Toronto's recent strategy is focusing a lot on bus rapid transit. Now, bus rapid transit is not the buses you know. It's buses that are really functioning almost like rapid transit in terms of the number of buses on a corridor, the, the, the design of the bus so you can get on and off easily, the prepayment, many, many things to make it move and function almost like rapid transit, but at one-tenth the cost. In Curitiba, the, the bus rapid transit costs one penny on the dollar of an American tra rapid transit. So it can be put in place a lot cheaper. And if you take almost any suburban corridor where there are those vast parking lots, and you put bus rapid transit in first, and you have to dedicate some of the road space to it, not a lot, but you have to dedicate some, then you will set off development. I was also a developer for a couple of years um, after I left the government. And you know, a developer needs some confidence that those investments are going to be there. Buses aren't strong enough. Bus rapid transit is strong enough. So you'll find developers will then go and want to cluster around that. And then that process can be set off. And then what happens is that as you build demand, you convert it to rapid transit over the long run. Stephen, any last words? Uh, not on that question. I think I'll look at that stand. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for attending today's Carbon Talk, and I'd uh, like to offer a big hand to Stephen and Larry for coming in today. As a reminder, this talk will be archived on our YouTube channel uh, next week. Keep an eye on our newsletter. Um, we're working on a December Carbon Talk. And I'm also reminded to bring your attention to a Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions event entitled BC's Balancing Act, Forest Fires, Ecology, Smoke, and Health. And that takes place this Thursday at 7 p.m. in uh, the WASP Center, right, Nishnika? Oh, the BD School for Business. So Thursday at 7 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.